welcome to Magical Storytelling. I'm your host, Elizabeth Dylan Berkovici. And today we have an incredible storyteller for you. A very warm welcome to Emer Stassen. It is my great honor to introduce someone witchy, wise, and magical. When Emer tells stories, there is a whimsy and joy that flows through her words, like a rushing waterfall of divine enchantment. Emer is upholding the mantle of the ancient Irish storyteller, the Shanaki. Her knowledge and love of old stories is inspiring. But besides that, Emer proudly identifies as a witch. It wouldn't be magical storytelling without us having someone truly magical as part of this series. Both Shanaki and witch, Emer has a deep knowledge of the Irish and Scottish storytelling traditions. And I am so grateful to have her here with us. I know she has powerful magic to bring through. So a little bit more about Emer. Aimir is a trainer, soul-based coach, storyteller, and writer. In Irish mythology, Emer is said to possess the six gifts of womanhood. Emer sets out to expand and rewrite these ancient stories to bring her fullness and wholeness back into balance. Her career began in corporate financial services, working in Ireland, Australia, and the UK. In 2014, she took on internal career change into learning and development a move which planted the seeds for her future freelance calling. At the beginning of 2017, she finally listened to the tug of her soul to seek nourishment and expansion out with corporate and dove headfirst into entrepreneurship. When stepping onto this path, it continues to return her home to her ancient roots, to the soulful truth of who she is becoming. She helps ignite the spark of remembrance in others to rewrite their soul stories so they can bring their fire to the world. Aimir is from Dublin, Ireland, and lives in central Scotland with her husband, three children, and puppy Riley. So welcome. I'm, I'm so, um, so excited to um, have you. Thank you so much for that gorgeous introduction as well. It was so wonderful. Oh, it was my pleasure. Like I just, I, I, was, I was saying to Aimir before the call, I can just feel all the magic flowing in. I'm just so ecstatic that you know, we're gonna bring, I feel like some very, very po powerful magic through for our listeners today. Yes. So I wanted to start by actually kind of like piggybacking off of you know, your, you know, your biography because there's that beautiful story you know, that you said like the character who like, you, it's your namesake, Emer is said to possess the six gifts of womanhood. So that's a story I've never heard before. And I would love if you could, you know, you could share that story with us. It sounds really beautiful. Yes, absolutely. So Emer, in fact, I've um, three other siblings and we're all named after uh, mythological characters. So my parents obviously like the Irish myths, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, Emer was the wife of Coo Cullen. Now your listeners may have heard of Coo Cullen, who was a very well-known Irish warrior in ancient times. So I felt that Emer really had a second place to him in terms of popularity and knowledge over who she was. Um, and it said that Emer has the six gifts of womanhood. And these were apparently revered gifts in pre-Celtic and Celtic times in Ireland. So the gifts are, and I've got them here in my laptop too, so I remember them all. Um, they are beauty, but of course, chastity, sweet speech, so our voice, needlework, so the craft, craftiness, um, voice as well, and wisdom. So beauty, chastity, sweet speech, needlework, voice, and wisdom. So they are the six gifts of womanhood. And really yeah, yeah. And a big part, and people can interpret them as they wish, you know, they're open to interpretation as well. Um, but part of my journey is both claiming these six gifts and realizing that we are more than any number of gifts we have infinite number of gifts that we're being called to really sink into and to bring to our work to our life to our voice to our creations to our writing so that's Emer and her six gifts so part of my story is rewriting the story of Emer as it was written in ancient mythology 
Yeah, no, I really liked that. It was funny when you were first telling that story, I actually thought of Sleeping Beauty because I know like the fairies give her, you know, like the gift of beauty. And then there's another fairy that says, my gift will be the gift of song. And it's just yeah. kind of funny. It's like, do we, like, are we born with these gifts? You know, like, do we have like a destiny because of these gifts or can we choose in this lifetime, the gifts that we want to embody and bring forth into the world? And I, I think it's kind of a dance of both. And that's kind of why it's cool that you're rewriting the story because I think sometimes people think, well, I wasn't, you know, naturally born a storyteller. I wasn't naturally born a singer. You know, could I really do that? And it really kind of comes down to as us being divine creators. Yes, you can do anything that you want if you choose it. And I think that that's why it's so powerful. You're rewriting that story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I take inspiration from everyday life and other writers as well. And it was actually only recently I read um, Sharon Blackie. You may oh, know, I know her. her. I know. Yeah, she's written many amazing books, but I read her more, one of her more recent books, Foxfire Wolfskin and Other Stories of Shapeshifting Women. And there's a chapter on Emer. And she yeah, rewrote everywhere. <laughs> yes, all of a sudden I've seen Emers everywhere. You know, it's not really a known name outside of Ireland, I would say. And she had rewritten the story of Emer, and I just loved it. And reading that, it, it was almost like permission for me to go, whoa, I can rewrite my story. <laughs> like this excitement rising up in me. So it was that inspiration from that I realized we can choose whatever story we wish mm. and why not choose the one that's going to be the most helpful the most resourceful the most magical <laughs> yeah no I love that and I think that people often just like I think as human beings like I replay sometimes in my head a lot of old stories and I'll be like this this I could be having this amazing day like with you like like having this incredible interview but in the back of my head I'll be like oh that thing five years ago that broke my heart oh that thing and I'm like and I was, I tell myself, I'm like, this is crazy. This day is a gift. And I have to make sure that I'm honoring the story that my soul is creating, that whatever happened in the past, you know, whatever the old story was that today I birth, today I live a new story. And like, yeah. and I think that's one thing that, you know, when we, when you and I first connected, we talked about, that's one thing that makes Ireland really unique is that everything is a story. I mean, it's true for everywhere, but especially in Ireland. Because I, I, I know you said like you go to the grocery store and they're just, you know, everyone's got to tell you the story of their day, the story of their lives. And it's just, I think a very different world when you really take ownership of the power you have to tell the story of your own, feel like your own unique creation. Yes, absolutely. And it really creates that connection as well. It is. The story is the connection between people. Mm. And also, I feel it allows you to sink in, to slow down and sink into that story and take the parts of it that are going to really resonate deeply for you as well. And yeah, everyone, you know, for, for anyone that's been to Ireland or, or wants to go, it's like you, you ask for directions and it's like, yeah, hang on a minute, I've just got a story to tell you first before I give you the directions. You know, it really is. There's it's it's stories everywhere. And as you were speaking, it's um, I wrote this series at the beginning of the year called The Spiral Path of Place. And this is this is what we're walking. It is the spiral path. And it's just lots of lots of iterations of these experiences that create our ongoing story. So whether you're thinking of what's happened in the past or five years ago, it's still part of you and your story right now. And then here we have this choice of how we step forward on the next step of the spiral path. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really beautiful. And I also just, I, I love being in your energy and hearing your words of wisdom because it's so funny for me. You know, I've, I've been to Ireland and such a different pace of life because I grew up right outside of New York City. And it's funny because I can feel my energy is like a bullet, like, boom. <laughs> and, and I talk to you, I'm like, oh, let me like, and I remember when I was in Ireland, it was the same kind of thing. There is this real kind of emphasis on just like slowing down and being. And I think that it's funny because we think of storytelling, it almost feels like an act of doing, but really mm. I feel like it's an act of just kind of being with what has been and being with what you are in the moment. 
And, you know, like one thing that I kind of had to learn is I always thought about like telling the story was more like a performance, like an actor, like an actress. And, you know, somebody once said to me, it's not really about that. It's about feeling the story in your bones. It's, there is no performance. You are the story. And, yeah. and I feel like, you know, when I think into the energy of like Ireland or Scotland, that kind of more slowed down, like that stillness, I feel like that's the place where stories can really live and breathe in that place. Yes, absolutely. And what I love to, to offer the reader or the listener for the stories is that it becomes a full sensory experience mm. so that you are in the story, you are walking with me as I write. So whether that's writing in the present tense, like right now, or bringing in all the different aspects of, you know, our visual, kinesthetic, auditory, bringing all these in through our words, through our descriptions, through colours. And I feel the real true and honest way to do that is just as you've said, to, to have lived it. It's based on our experience, you know, and part of the Shana Key, which is storyteller in Irish, you know, part of the ancient storyteller, there is that performance aspect. There is that, you know, as well as feel the, better. <laughs> you know, bringing it to life, you know, bringing the story to life to how you voice that and share that with others. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I think it's actually as we're going into this, that was like my next question was, I think if you could illuminate for the audience, because I know people who are familiar with your work will know about the Shonaki, but I think like, you know, I have a lot of people who are like, you know, poets, priestesses, and like, I don't know if they're as familiar with that tradition. So I would love if you could, um, could speak to that for us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the Shonaki, it's really a word that I've started um feeling connected to really only, only over the last year. And I think before we, um, when we first connected and spoke, I was sharing that actually the word was, was dropped in, I would say by the trees, by the Scots pine trees outside in, in the woods where I like to go and, and walk and nourish myself. So it was like this shanaki just dropped in. And I thought, of course, that's like phew, the connection to the ancient wisdom. So it is the Irish, um, for storyteller and the ancient people you know um, 5,000 plus years ago they were an oral society so other than what was written and carved into rocks or carved out of the beautiful gold that has been found in these sacred sites um, everything was spoken and it was spoken through story through mythology through symbology cosmically through the alignment of these sites with the stars with the solstice suns you know all of this it was all very very symbolic and powerful and intelligent and it said that the back in the ancient times the storyteller and the poet they were held in very high regard because they are the keepers of the sacred story the keeper of all this wisdom that we can still access today. So apparently they would spend time in the dark, in caves, memorizing these poems, connecting in with this ancient wisdom. And I imagine them, you know, at the sacred sites because the stones as well are often called the story keepers when we connect with the ancient stones. So it was, it was them, they were seen as carrying forth the, the law you know, the lore and the law, the sacred law and sacred lore, and carrying that forward in down through the ages, through the timelines. And it was all verbal, memorized. So, you know, even up to like my, well, my mother would still tell stories of, you know, think her experiences and also the mythology as well. So the Shanaki is very able to connect the, the modern times where we are now, the here and now, with the ancient. And it's like it is a cyclical spiral of time as opposed to linear time. So we're connecting with the spiral of time, the ancient and the modern. And what can we learn and draw from that for the times that we're in now? So, yeah, it was a very, it was a very revered, um, you know, reverential space for that, for that story keeper. They were looked up to, they were an integral part of 
society of of the the tribe. <laughs> Yeah, no, what's, what's coming through for me, because I've been, you know, trying to, um, you know, to write up the description for this big event. And, you know, I go into usually more of a channeling state. And what I what I keep coming up with is like the power of the storyteller. It's funny, because like, you know, the event is magical storytelling. But when I'm in this channeling state, it's all about the power of the storyteller. And I'm trying to figure out how to like, you know, make it sound pretty, but I, it's like one of those things that what keeps coming through for me, and I was listening to something that you um, I think was something that you did like in the summer where you're talking about, um, you know, many years ago, instead of Netflix, you know, like we would sit and we would listen to the storytellers, it, you know, like, and, and I feel like once upon a time, storytellers held this place in our hearts. It was the ultimate source of both wisdom and entertainment. And, and I feel that in today's world, there is a great longing in our souls to, to reclaim the storyteller. And I, I feel that, you know, when, when I was a kid, it was something, that's what you did when you were a kid is you listen to all the stories. And there is, I feel like there was like that kind of reverence, like you said, you know, mm. to just kind of sit and bear witness. And, and I think as people have gone forth for me, at least, you know, becoming an adult, it's like that spell is broken, not for me, but for so many people and that power of the storyteller has been lost. And part of why I was called to create this event is because I felt this very, you know, I was in meditation. I had my guides coming in. It was all about bringing back this sacred ancient energy of the storyteller. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you to have you speak, because I feel like you also could, could speak to that. And how, how do we bring this sacred power back to the world? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's a big question. And I really feel that the fundamental starting point is connecting with the story within mm. you. Okay. So even, you know, this life, um, in this life, what is the story? What, you know, what did you enjoy growing up? What kinds of things lit you up? What kinds of things were you most afraid of? Or, you know, were you fearful of? And there's story in all of this, in all of this. So part of... um when I ran this Shanaki storytelling program during the year, um, part of the demonstration that inspiration is everywhere was asking people to, you know, pick up either a feather or a pine cone or something that you find in nature and just find a way of describing it, of bringing it to life through story, through yeah. your voice or through writing it out on your pages. And we can create stories around anything. And it's also a beautiful way, I find, to um, portray the most powerful and, um, yeah, powerful, <laughs> there's that word again, message. Because when it's wrapped in this, it's like the swaddling arms of a story, I feel you can't get defensive with that because that's the truth of the story. So we can relay very powerful messages that we need in these times. I feel that's why, why we do need story because everything is a story and we do need the nourishment of that. Yeah, no, I, I saw, I'm, as I'm like, like listening to everything you're saying, I'm really feeling the presence. Like I, I was studying you very intensely when I was like preparing for this interview and I was looking at, you know, the Shanaki program you offered. And I know that you, you know, told the story of, I call her Queen Mab. I'm not sure if that's the right way to say her name, but I feel her presence right now very, very strongly. <laughs> I, was, I, was like, I was like freaking out. I was like, oh my God, I feel this. So I was wondering um, if you could tell us some of her story and if there's any kind of message that comes through you from her or maybe from the story itself, because I feel I'm supposed to, to guide us into that story. Yeah. Oh, that's gorgeous. And it's so interesting. It's, it's Queen Maeve because um, I was actually on a course over the weekend with a wonderful lady called Amantha Murphy, who has written The Way of the Shavan. So she is a story keeper and teller herself. And she was talking about Queen Maeve. It was, and... so I was like, I was literally just like, I got so, like, <laughs> I got freaked out for a second. I was like, I gotta, I gotta segue into this. I gotta let her tell the story. Cause I feel like, you know, before I, you know, let you speak, you just, I want to say to the audience that 
the way at least I perceive reality is that, you know, yes, we're in this 3D world, but there are these beings like, you know, that are just like across the, you know, across the aisle, so to speak, just like one dimension away that are looking into our world and are working with us and helping us and connecting with us in the most beautiful, magical ways. And when I create, when I tell stories, I usually, I invoke their wisdom, I invoke their magic. And that's part of why I think that invoking with these sacred beings is very important for storytellers. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's the, it's the archetype. So we feel we can relate to this person, this being. And I do believe, I imagine all these people and energies were people, you know, at one stage mm-hmm. and they're all part of us. So Queen Maeve, uh, it's actually something Amantha Murphy shared at the weekend was often in modern times known as the the hussy, which I don't know if that's a word you would use yeah, in, in America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So not a very complimentary word, you know, uh, because Queen Maeve would, um, but in ancient times, she was fully, she was like the warrior goddess, the, the warrior witch who was fully in her power. And she would be seen with this, with like a spear, I imagine her with this spear, not going out to kill or hunt or fight, but it was like a demonstration of her power of this lady in her sovereignty. And part of the, um, some of the mythology, the ancient mythology was that when a chieftain or a king of the land of Ireland was going to be chosen, it would actually be the decision of the goddesses, of the priestesses of the land. And so somebody like Maeve as one of the archetypes would invite the men, the potential chieftains to come and lie with her, you know, to to sleep with her basically overnight. And then she would decide if they had the attributes to become (laughs) the chieftain of the land. (laughs) I love that. I mean, I think that that was the thing because I feel like there's a lot of disempowerment. You know, I think that women are working through and now it's like, oh, a man has to choose you. But, you know, once upon a time, it was like, no, you choose like you as the woman, you're the sacred vessel. You get to choose who you want. Like, and I think that that's part of why I think Queen Mab, like, I feel like that's part of why her story was kind of changed. It almost kind of reminds me of like the Mary Magdalene, you know, type thing where, you know, being portrayed as a whore and now it's like she's the apostle of the apostles but it's yeah. almost like her name for thousands of years was like run through the mud because you know the patriarchy wanted to really I feel like suppress the the mystical power of women you know and yes. and so that's kind of what I what first came to mind when you were telling that story yes absolutely and part of that part of what I feel my work here is and my soul work is to um, not even bring it back because it's still here, but to um, bring it out into the open, our mystical feminine powers, these powers that were subjugated and hidden and cut off, severed. You know, um, many women or clients that, that I support often find it hard to share their voice, to speak aloud, to share our truth. And that's been part of my journey as well. And I feel these archetypes, these women, um these powerful beings are really they are tapping on our back and going come on you know we'll support you you need to tell our story and what I love to do is to do a bit of studying about the tradition how the traditional myth went and then I like to rewrite it for myself you know so it's like kind of it becomes your yeah it becomes it becomes mine and it becomes then I feel that's my way of connecting in with the story to then share with others, to embody the story and share that with others as well. So I, it's a way I enjoy, I enjoy to do it because there's so much, there's so such a wealth and richness of Irish mythology. And um, yeah, it, it can become, I find I can get lost in it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a beautiful maze though it's no but I I, I appreciate that because it's kind of like we were saying earlier about the story being in your bones when you're rewriting the story it is your story it's like you lived it I think yes. I think that's the thing is like I think those great storytellers whether they were you know fully channeling or they were performing they were living the story and I think that's it's just kind of exactly what you said in the beginning it's like start with your story because like we all have these stories that like you know every day is a new page and, and I just, I feel that's really profound. Um, 
I wanted to ask, yeah. we're still in this kind of like kind of sacred goddess storytelling energy. Um, I also wanted to bring up, I, I'm not sure if I say, is it like Bridget or Brigid? Because I, I heard when I first came into this, I heard Brigid and I was like, I don't know if this is some weird ancient way of saying her name, but I, I have had this other being. I feel like she's also really here bringing this, bringing this event online for people to connect mm -hmm. with their inner storyteller. So I would love if you could share some of her story. Cause I know that you work with her too. Mm, yeah and I would say it's been Bridget who I first she was probably the first goddess or witch goddess that I use the word interchangeably that I connected with initially and um to help me because part of my journey is reconnecting with my Irishness and what the heck that means you know in this day and age so Bridget is I just, you know, I feel so much love for all these, all these goddesses and Bridget has a special place for me. So she is the triple goddess mm -hmm. and I would say Bridget, um, it would be a common, quite a, quite a common name in, in Ireland, Bridget, or I had an Auntie Bridey or my, my sister's middle name is Bridget because she was born at February time. So February um, in Bollock or in Bulk is her festival and bullock means belly so it's in the belly of so oh. bridget as the triple goddess yeah <laughs> bridget as triple goddess invites us to um tap into our our belly our womb spaces or the energetics of that to, as um to connect with what wants to be birthed through us and as triple goddess she is um, the keeper of the sacred flame. So when I connect in with Bridget, her place is Kildare, because in ancient times, she's said to have founded a priestess temple in Kildare, which is just outside Dublin in the east. Ireland's ancient east, as it's now called, <laughs> where you may have you may have gone there. Um, and 19 of her priestesses maintained and kept that flame a lit a light mm. and I just love the connection with fire you know I really connect in with fire anyway I'm Sagittarian and um fire is I feel very connected to the element of fire I'm, I'm Leo I'm very I'm with <laughs> you I, <laughs> people don't get it it's a thing it's like I know I've had this problem in my life I've got like all these friends who are air signs and water signs and like I'm like no it's fire, <laughs> fire. Uh, yeah, so we're yeah yeah and how we've been sometimes um perhaps taught or conditioned to fear our fire and what what Bridget has helped me to do is to reconnect with this fire that's always been here but maybe the flame had just gone out a little bit you know so to tend to our inner fires and voice that and feel that and use that as a source of sustenance. And I do this action, I'm not sure if you can see, it's like it oh, comes up from within me, like, woo, you know, it gives me energy, it brings me energy when I speak about her. Um, and she's also the midwife, you know, whether the midwife birthing babies and supporting their journey or um, the midwife in new ideas, creations, events like this beautiful event you're creating she will support you and she's the poet mm -hmm. so the word witch casting her spells with her gorgeous magic um and yeah that's that's bridget i imagine her um with this fiery red hair that it's like her head is a is a flame on mm -hmm. fire you know, as tending tending to this so on the celtic medicine wheel she's in the northeasterly direction which is one of the, the hinges as they're called of of the year so the first of february round about the end of january beginning of february is her her time mm, i know I, I know I get very excited about that. It was really funny. Like the first time I really connected with Bridget was this year. And it was funny because I, like, I was just, I had this beautiful goddess deck and I kept pulling her card and it was right before in bulk. And I was just like, I don't really know why is this goddess keep showing up. And it was funny. Cause like, I was kind of not heeding the call. 
I was just like, okay, whatever. Like, and I didn't realize until I started seeing her name in everything that I was reading. Cause I was exploring all this kind of Celtic mythology, like the way of the old storytellers. And suddenly it was like everywhere I went, this goddess was showing up. And I, I feel like that I kind of want to ask you, cause I feel like this is kind of what is like coming through is, you know, for someone like, you know, you're Sagittarius, I'm Leo. So we have, we have fire, but I feel like a lot of, there are a lot of people who might be listening who like, they don't have that same innate fire. And, you know, working with Bridget is a way of, I think, really cultivating that fire and like fanning those flames. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, because I think when you have a lot of fire and that's your main element, creating is like breathing, you know, like, and creating is like breathing for all of us. But I think sometimes we need to kind of be reminded how to cultivate that inner fire. So I wonder if you Mm -hmm. could speak to that as a fellow fire. Oh, yeah. oh, I love that. I love that. I feel um, so connecting with Bridget and also opening yourself up to the connection to fire, because I do feel a lot of us have closed down and fear fire. And we may talk about witches um, during this conversation, but I feel if, if if many of us have had past lives, maybe um, we were witches, maybe we were burnt or killed in some awful way, and fire may have been part of that. So I think the fire elemental has been turned against us in the past. Um, so we're rekindling, befriending the fire again. So I would say understanding and acknowledging that, that there may be pain there, Mm. because of past experiences with fire in particular even saying the word might feel like a trigger for for some people and opening acknowledging that and opening up to allowing fire to reconnect and speak with you again lighting a candle something I love having candles around when I'm working and just watching the flames noticing the color the oranges the black the amber and noticing how that dances how the flames dance and perhaps dancing with that flame as well and becoming the fire and opening up to what fire what messages want to come through and I wrote a a poem a couple of years ago when I was connecting with Bridget so this is how I connect with and share my fire and it was around feeling the fire and also feeding the fire. Yeah, feel it and feed it. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I just feel like that's so important. I really want like our audience like to really kind of grasp that because I think that, you know, we were talking about the witch wounds and I think that it really is a wound for all women, whether they want to identify as witches in this life or past lives, because it's the idea of the woman's voice, the woman's power being taken away. And that fire is that power. And so when we call that fire forth, when we cultivate it in ourselves, then we have the power to create the life of our dreams. Then we have the fire and the power to feed into our creations. And, yeah. and I think that we women need to, need to remember how to cultivate that sacred fire. And that's why I think what you said was just so beautiful. Yes, thank you so much. And yeah, the other aspect that came came through there was around when we connect in this way and invite in goddesses like Bridget or Maeve or other archetypes like Bowen or the Kalyach, you know, other other archetypes that I'm talking about Irish archetypes, but there's many, many others around the world. And when we connect in that way, we won't we won't burn ourselves out. Mm. We won't because we're working in a way that's nourishing to us. Yeah, no, I, I have like a bunch of other questions, but I feel like we're on fire. So I want to stay here for one more minute, but I really, I, I would love if you could speak to something really fast because for me as a, like one of my big, you know, I think life lessons has been learning, I think how to manage my fire because I would always burn myself out. I would go 110% and then I'd be like, oh, and, I, and, and I think that that's like a really important part of creative maturity is learning how to sustain that fire. And so even though you're honoring that fire, you're tending to it, it doesn't get burnt out. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. 
Yeah, something, and I totally relate to that as well. And especially with, you know, I was 20 years in the corporate world and it is all about, you know, come on, do, 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 results, action. And um, so when I stepped out of corporate in 2017, um, I didn't have a plan. You know, I opened up to whatever was going to come my way. And I spent a lot of that time in the woods. So I didn't chock a block up my calendar and my diary. You know, I really took my time. And that's a privilege, I know, to be able to do that and to have that choice. So tending to it for me was spending so much time in nature and outside as much as possible. And then also reconnecting with the, the Celtic medicine wheel, which feels very resonant for me. And I know so resonant, resonant to many others who feel connected to the Celtic lineage and Irish tradition. So starting to learn, and I'm still learning and still on this journey. It's a lifelong journey. It's connecting with the seasons of the years and connecting in with where you feel you are in the seasons. Because I don't always feel like summertime is all about goddess Anya and it's like Leo isn't it shining your light and all of that and this summer I didn't feel like that you know so it's where we are in connection to the the wheel as well you know the invitation is to follow um, those cycles and nature is our greatest teacher isn't it yeah and just no, taking right. that time I think that's very wise too, because I, you know, like I, like I said, like I identify with being like a Leo, like having that fire energy. But I remember talking to somebody about like, it was like, oh, there's like a Mercury in retrograde. There's one of those big things happening. And this person who was more of an astrologer said, well, yeah, that's, that's happening, but actually it's your kind of individual astrology. You know, like, it's like how that is really like how the different things are going to affect you. And like, you know, when you were born and all that kind of stuff, like the time and everything. And it made me kind of think that, you know, while we are still connected to everything that's happening outside of us, the seasons, it is a very individualized, it is a very much like the universe, the universe has a special kind of thing that's happening just for us individually. And we have to feel into that and honor what we're really actually going through, regardless of like what's supposed to be happening. Yes, absolutely. And there's something else about water as well you know, as the, as the balance to, to fire. So when I'm um, sharing or we're, we're um, connecting in with the fire elemental, I invite people to have a glass of water there too, you know, just in case. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. I, I lived, um, I lived in China for a year when I was younger and it was interesting because they have this idea that like all the food itself is yin and yang. So I remember mm -hmm. that there is this one type of like, it was like a special fruit and it was called like a Dorian and it was like a delicious, delicious fruit, but it was like so young that like you had to have some kind of yin, like some kind of liquid that would balance it out afterwards. And it was so interesting for me living over there because like not, that was like a classical way of thinking. And I lived in a kind of a very traditional part of China. So a lot of it wasn't like that, but it was that same kind of thing about coming into balance in all aspects of being. And so I feel like that's something that the Celtic tradition also really honors is when you're talking about the wheel of the year, it is that aspect of balance. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And the center coming into our center in the wheel is the place of sovereignty and power and mm -hmm. rulership over our life. So it's bringing when every, all the aspects of the wheel converge into this center point. You know, and I, I love that. <laughs> I love that too. So I feel like this is actually a good segue point because I wanted to ask you um, about the connection between land and story. So I was wondering, like, if you could tune in and see if maybe the land has something that wants to come through you, or even if you just want to talk to that very sacred intertwined connection between land and story. Mm. Yes, absolutely. So something for me, I hadn't been home to Ireland. So it's all, I've been in Scotland 20 years, but I haven't Ireland is still my home as well. And um, see, this is my story before the story. <laughs> oh, I know. This is what I love about you. It's like, we're getting to the story, but it's like roundabout. I, I think yeah. that's very important. <laughs> and, um, so 
I feel like because I hadn't been over because of COVID and all of that, I hadn't been over to Ireland in 16 months. And it was, it's the longest time I'd been away. So I felt like I, that's when I became even more connected to the Celtic wheel and the goddesses and all things Irish and Celtic, basically. And I felt like the land, Ireland, was calling me, was calling me home. So that when I did go back in July, I went back for a whole month with the family, which was amazing. And I was placing my feet, the soles of my feet on the land. It was just like this. I, I thought being a fire sign, it would be like whoop, inspiration would come up and it would be wild and crazy. But actually it was like this earthing, almost like a taming of me mm. and a grounding. And I found this peace, these moments of peace and tranquility and stillness within me that I had not noticed before. And that was in various different places in, you know, going up the Dublin mountains and connecting, walking on the feather beds, which are, it's all turf up in the Dublin mountains. They're very small rolling hills. So connecting with the turf, which is, has been called Ireland's gold. It's ancient thousands, 10,000 year old trees, you know, peat that has, um, mulched down to create this amazing this amazing carbon sink you know turf um connecting with that turf and um there's something about it that helps me connect with the land and the ancestors of the land and then other places like going over to Loch Gur and the Grange Stone Circle which is the largest stone circle in Ireland and taking off my sandals and walking barefoot on the grass there around the stone circle and inside it's 113 stones of these ancient stones that's like 5,000 years old and connecting to the land in that way and it was just so magical <laughs> really like and emotional as well connecting in this way so I feel like the land I call it I wrote a poem um about Ireland is the Shanachy. Ireland oh God, is. That sounds, sorry, that sounds incredible. <laughs> yeah, and that came through when I was designing the Shanachy course. That's just the way like the inspiration comes in. That Ireland is the Shanachy and that she is aching for her stories to be told and her wisdom to be shared. Because there's so much that has happened on the land of Ireland you know, physically for our people. We're a colonized country. You know, we've been, we were under um, British rule for 800 years. And many, many people came to Ireland. You know, the Celts arrived into Ireland, weren't born there. So, you know, we've had many visitors along the way. And I feel the land is speaking to us. And so many people are connecting to help her heal. She's not sick but just to help her heal and come into balance, which will help us heal and come into balance and to share her stories because it's Ireland, but it's also O-U-R, it's our land because mm. we can all connect to that. Yeah, no, I love that so much because when I was getting ready for our call, like I told you before we started, like I felt so much energy coming through and I was like, what is this? And I really did feel, cause I, you know, I have Irish blood. I was like, Oh my God, as I thought, I was like, I think it's the energy of Ireland. It's just like, what is this? And yeah, you know, I can just, I feel so much. That's one of the reasons why I was also so excited to have you. So I really do feel like Ireland wants her stories told. And so I'm going to ask you in a minute, like to tell, like, you know, if like there's a story that comes through that the land wants to speak through you. But I also just wanted to just to clarify something you said, because so it's funny because I had, you know, a friend who visited Ireland and they felt like all the magic had gone from the land. And, mm. and the reason, well, I, it wasn't the reason, but you know, it was kind of because of colonization. And this person brought up to me, uh, the story of St. Patrick and how, you know, I think it's the whole thing when all the snakes, you know, were, were gone from Ireland, that being a metaphor for the magic, you know, being, you know, like, I guess like burned out of the land. And so I'm wondering if, you know, how you feel about that. Maybe 
my friend was an intuitive person, but I'm just wondering like if you as somebody who it's in your blood, it's in your bones, what do you feel about, you know, about the land in, in, in light of everything that has transpired, you know, over the last few hundred years in Ireland? Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree in, in many cases. You know, we, we celebrate St. Patrick's Day globally. You know, everything turns green, doesn't it? I know, right? Um, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even pints of Guinness turn turn green. Um, <laughs> they dye the Liffey, the river that runs through Dublin. They dye it green for St. Patrick's Day. Oh, my God, so I didn't know that. Wow. It becomes a whole celebration of... Irishness, basically drinking loads and dancing and acting the Egypt, basically. But um, I would agree. I wrote, um, yeah, I, again, this is how I express this writing through it. And I wrote a, a poem around, it, it actually was on St. Patrick's Day this year in March. And um, it was questioning, who am I when I'm Irish today? So I wrote it on St. Patrick's Day on the 17th of March. Of this year and it was an exploration because I was getting angry as I can do with St. Patrick and wondering whether he was the villain as opposed to the saint that he is being called. And as and, I, was thinking, I was like is this man really good you know and it's funny though because you grow up yeah. hearing that for me yeah. in America it's not the same but it's like Chris Columbus like what when I was mm. like, we were taught like it was like Columbus Day and it was like to celebrate this person and then I grew up and I learned the horror and I was like I, it's, it's really, I think hard to kind of wrap your head around like the, you know, way, the way that when you're a kid, somebody is portrayed as a hero and then you learn mm -hmm. the truth again, going back to the power of story, you learn the wrong story or like the story that's not a true story. And then when you learn the one that is the truth, it's like yeah. the, the truth, it, it can't be hidden. It, it's like a light that just is so illuminating that once you know it, you can't unknow it. Yes. Yeah. Which I would say is like the fire. That's the sacred fire of inspiration mm -hmm. coming out, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I feel, you know, when I feel into St. Patrick, I feel like he's a good man and had good intentions. But Ireland didn't have snakes. So it is very much metaphoric mm. that it was the banishing of the snake. And yes, I would connect in with that being the feminine, the Shakti, you know, that power that was banished from Ireland erased from the texts hidden underground and there were many priests and monks that had written had begun to record the oral lore which is why we know the myths now so they were written down which is amazing and there were some amazing books that were hidden that weren't destroyed like the book of Kells is a very famous yes. book in, in Trinity College um, However, yeah, it was the gradual changeover from the earth, earthy religion or pagan religion to Christianity. Um, and there are many things that we still do as ritual today. And, you know, there's a St. Bridget that we honor at February time who came from the original goddess, Bridget, you know. Um, but yeah, I would say it's, has wounded Ireland tremendously because, you know, in the 1800s, like it's not even that long ago, it was illegal to speak our native tongue, to speak Irish. You know, it was illegal. Mm. And there was this um, stick called the tally stick, mm. that children, um, if children spoke Irish in school, there were marks made on this tally stick mm. and they would be beaten. Oh my God, that's horrible. Yeah, now I don't know if this happened in all of Ireland, but I read about this, that this did, this did happen. So it was beaten out of us, basically, the, our native tongue. And, um, you know, many of the aspects I feel have been retained and maintained through our music, through the place names that are still in Irish and English. And Ireland, Irish, the language is still very much alive in Gaeltacht areas, like Ooh. purely Irish speaking areas in Ireland. And um, quite, it's mainly the West Coast, like from Donegal, Galway, Kerry, Cork, like it's a lot of, along the West Coast. Um, and it's been maintained through the language because it never died. It just had to go underground for a while <laughs> the spirit never dies of the I, land I love that 
because that was the thing too. Like I said, like, you know, this person I knew who was intuitive, you know, it's like, I, I loved hearing what you said, which was like, no, that, you know, that kind of that essence of the land, like it can't die. It's like, like it was mother earth. It can't, it's still there. And so I think yeah. that's, um, I think my question for you and trying to like figure out the exact wording is how do we, I guess like the words coming through is like heal, like, you know, heal like the land of Ireland, heal the earth. But also I th- feel like be totally in oneness and harmony with her and so that we are telling her stories again and that she's thriving again as the storyteller, as the Shanaki. How do we, how do we do that? Is there a story that you can maybe tell like that? Because I feel like you kind of in this moment, you are embodying, I feel like the Shanaki of Ireland. So I feel like mm-hmm. you telling these stories is a way of healing her. Oh, I love that. No pressure, right? No pressure. I know, right? I was like, I was like, that's why I was like, i how is this question coming through? If you don't have one right now, it's okay. I was just like, I was just like, what is this question? And then it was like, okay, I guess it's the question. I love that. I love that. So the image that's what's going through my mind is this image of the ancient priestess. And it's something that comes to me. It's it's almost like you know the way people sometimes were told to have this power pose, like you know, oh, to yeah, get into power the pose. Be strong. I know. <laughs> yeah, superwoman. For me, this is like the being the ancient priestess, and it might be Bridget, it might be Bowen, um, but I imagine I am in Newgrange. I don't know if you went to Newgrange when you were in Ireland. Um, I was mostly in County Clare. So okay, yeah, you were you were west. So Newgrange is one of the oldest megalithic structures, apparently in in the world. It's older than the pyramids, older than Stonehenge. And it's a womb tomb. It's called a tomb, but I know it's, many of us know it's a womb as well in the way it's shaped like a mound. Mm -hmm. And then the winter solstice sun shines in through its passageway and into the main chamber, the rising winter solstice sun. So it's perfectly aligned to to that time of year. And I I feel very connected to this place I've been there a few times you go on tour and you go into the chamber and it's pitch black and then they put on a torch and simulate the rising sun and even that simulation is magical so there's the story before the story I imagine I am the priestess I am the woman of the land and I'm holding this it's like a staff Oh, I um, love this. I can see this. I can see this in my mind's eye. Oh my God, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a giant torch because, yeah, and I feel like I'm banging it on the ground. I'm tap, tapping it or banging it with force on the ground. And I shared this with someone recently and I said, I'm awakening the earth. And she said to me, which is very much what you have said earlier, the earth is awake. The earth is already awake. What you're awakening is your template, your energetic soul template on this earth in this life now. Mm. So I imagine I'm banging the earth and there's like golden ripples that are rippling out energetically. Oh my God, I love that. I love that so much. (laughs) Around around the world and it's like it's awakening that power within me. And it just feels so powerful and also at the top of it, because I feel with the fire that we're reconnecting to, we're also the torch bearers. We are the keepers of this sacred flame because we're holding the torch Mm -hmm. and we are the torch for this new earth, this magical world that we're creating together. Yeah, that was so beautiful. I, I love that. <laughs> I know. But I think it's really interesting. Like one thing that I I've noticed, like, cause I've been like kind of paying attention to the times for a lot of people that it's about like 2017. That's so many spiritual people. They left their job in corporate. They stepped into their power. And I think it's crazy. I literally have seen this number. And I know that for me, that was, wow. I've been working on a novel, but like, that was when I was called to start this writing project. And it was wow. 2017. And I really do feel like so many of us who incarnated and they, we were just kind of like going about our lives. There was this moment like that, like collectively the, you know, I feel like, I don't know if it was like in the, in the ethers, in the earth where it was like, you guys got to wake up. 
You guys got to yeah. wake up because you're the ones I feel like, you know, like people like you and I, it's like, you're the ones that are going to be helping the others start. Like you said, like banging, you know, like, you know, banging your, I don't know if it's, it's not a torch. It's the, what do you call that? The, no, it's like a yeah. staff. The staff. Or a staff. Yes. Yeah. Banging this. Like, I feel like literally that's, you know, what we're doing, having these conversations. And I love how you said like, and then all the light is rippling because I, I feel like that's why, like, these are the moments where I feel like we were meant to wake up because now there's like the second wave of people who really are like being charged to step into their, their soul destinies, their templates in this lifetime. And again, it's the power of, I think it's, I call it pure soul power, but it's also the story that you are, the, the power of language, the power of the earth to activate people to be who they truly are meant to be in this lifetime. And even if like somebody is not a writer or a storyteller, there's, I call them Gaia beings. It's like, you're still like, it's like the earth is waking up. We, every ripple that we send out, every bit of light that we put into the world, we're waking more and more people up. And, yeah. and I feel like then the earth heals more and more every second because, yeah. because we have owned our light and owned our fire and owned our power. Yes. Yeah. And there's something else is the, the gold, as I see it as gold ripples and maybe other people will see that as a different color. And something I've been connecting in with just recently, just the past week is to reconnect with my gold within. Oh. You know, uh, because in these ancient sites, there were hordes of gold was often found, like 24 carat pure mm. gold that was probably found on the land of Ireland, in the mountains, in the rivers, in the streams. And it's amazing what it has been crafted into, like jewellery, torque necklaces like mm. so I imagine I'm wearing the tor you know the goddess necklace I'm the noble one shields as well ceremonial shields so this gold and connecting in with the energy of that which I feel is linked to fire as well and water too um, can really help us heal the land and I wonder if all that all these artifacts, I wonder if they're going to be returned to the land as opposed to being held in a museum. You know, they'll be returned to the land eventually um, for full, full healing, but connecting in with your inner gold, which is there too. I love that. I also, I also saw gold. Gold's one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> but um, so we're, before I like, I want to make sure I ask this question. So I wanted to also talk about the fairy folk. I was like, before I forget this, like I have to ask about them and the longstanding connection between Ireland and the little people, because I know they have a very, very rich history. And I would love if you could speak to that briefly. Yeah. And it almost seems like it's like second nature. You know, when I was growing up and particularly when we'd go on holidays to Cork and Kerry to where my family are from in the south of Ireland, you'd you know, we'd be warned, like if there was a ring of stones or any kind of circle or ring on the land, you were warned not to touch it, not to pick flowers there, not to go into it because they were the fairy forts or the fairy rings. So it, we basically grew up understanding with this like innate knowing you don't mess with the fairies in Ireland. <laughs> you don't mess with them because these are their sacred places where they are, where they reside, where they live. And you don't um, deface it or disturb anything there. So yeah, and the Hawthorne is particularly known as the fairy tree. So mm -hmm. the Hawthorne tree, which I think, I'm sure someone told me is also related to Christ and Mary. Oh, that's I know you mentioned Mary Magdalene yeah, yeah. earlier on. Um, so yeah, the Hawthorne tree is a sacred tree and it's found all around. It's actually found all around here as well, where I live in Scotland. And there's been a few cases over the years where a Hawthorne, where the government have wanted to cut down a tree and then people and local residents have argued against it, that you can't cut down the Hawthorne tree because it's a sacred tree. So there has been a case where um, a road is built around the hawthorn tree to to preserve the tree as we should be doing preserving the trees 
you know so yeah I feel the fairy folk for me when I connect in with um the fairies even when I'm walking in in the woods like I might see something out of the corner of my <laughs> eye or you know <laughs> And I feel like they're playing, you know, they're, for me, it feels like a very mischievous, like inner child playfulness. And, you know, I look at the grass, the long meadow grass, and it's like fairy fingers, or I see a buttercup and I imagine that's like the fairies are having a tea party. You know? Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. That's how I feel like when I see like, I'll go outside and I'll see like a butterfly swoop right past. I'm like, oh my God, it looks so magical. Like, it's like, I, I feel like they kind of come through this realm sometimes as mm. kinds of other beings, but I yeah. love, I love that because I think like for me, especially being like raised American, we don't really have those stories. And I remember when I was in Ireland, that was like a thing. It was like, Oh, be careful. Like I remember I had, I think it was like about 200 feet. I had to go through the grass to get to where I lived. Well, it was only for like, I was there for like a month, but it, I remember it was like, you better go fast. It's, it's like, it's the dark and it's like fairy time. And I was like, Oh my God, I gotta go here. And, and it, but it was funny though, because I remember there was like the storyteller. I think I mentioned, we were talking about it. His name was Eddie. I forgot his last name. Yeah. Yes. He was just like, like super big beard, like famous storyteller, um, like around County Clare. And it was funny because he was telling us a story about this like highway they had built and the people had warned them, like do it was over like a ferry port. It was like, do not build the highway here. And the people like, like, and they didn't listen to them and they built the highway anyway. And I think he said there were like something like there were like four or five car accidents, like at this exact spot right where the ferry port was, where they had built over it. So they had to take that part of the, they had to literally stop all traffic to that part of the highway. And I don't know if they rebuilt it or what they did, but it was funny because they like warned the government, don't do this. Like this is right over like, you know, the ring fort, the ferry fort, like don't do this. And they're like, oh my God, that's just old superstition. And then it was like a year later, they had to take it down. So I think that's very, I love stuff like that because it kind of, I mean, I believe in magic and fairies anyway, but it just kind of, it's nice when you kind of see things in, in 3d that are showing you that this isn't stuff that like, you know, we are just conjuring in our imagination. This is stuff that like these beings, like we are, we are all magical beings living in a magical world. If we can just waken, you know, if we can just awaken to it and really see, see it for what it actually is. Yeah. Yeah. And then life becomes so vibrant and alive and full of possibility and fun as well. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I was wondering actually if you could speak to fun because I had like, there is, um, there is like a, when I was a kid, there was a song that had like, like fun in it. And I got that in my head this morning and I hadn't heard it in like, like maybe 20 years. And I was like, I think this has to do with the call. So I think that it's like, you know, I don't know if it's like these beings or like, I just feel like there's this, there's a lack in our world about like how to connect Mm -hmm. in with the energy of fun. And so yeah. I, this is a spontaneous question, but I think that I had that song in my head earlier today because I was meant to to kind of nudge you uh, to kind of share your feelings on that word and how we how we invite that energy into our lives. Oh yeah, I love that, and it's really for me. It's about the permission, mm-hmm. you know, allowing ourselves to have fun, and that it's such an integral part of our nourishment as human beings to feel the fun and connect in with that whether it's connecting in with your inner child or the fairies or what brings you fun and you know so it's the fairy energy for me it brings that fun that mischievousness um and uh, connecting with you know I've mentioned the witches as well and connecting it reconnecting in with the witch and that word for me is actually it feels like a fun it feels like they are mischievous witches that are enticing me out to play and it's kind of like that it fun in a way where it's like I dare you I dare you to say that go on go on oh, you know, I love in, that. Yeah. in a helpful way in a growing way I will help you grow you know when you take on these challenges that are fun I'm gonna whisper things to you and see what you do you know it's like this kind of co-creative fun agree soul agreement that's going on 
let's whisper this to her and see what she does with this piece of information. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I know. Well, it reminds me too. There is um, there's a famous movie. It's called It's a Wonderful Life, and it's you know. Oh, famous- yeah. But I remember there's like this one part where Jimmy Stewart is like about to kiss like the woman he loves and he's like, he's a teenager, so he's not. And this older man walks past and he's like, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> it's like, it's like, and I always think about that because it's so true. It's like, I feel like, you know, especially if you're like, maybe like not incarnate on the planet, you realize what a gift it is to be here. And you're like, okay, these people need to stop like being like kind of shy and they just need to do the do the cool, amazing thing. Just go and be brave. And, you know, I think that's part of why when like the witches are whispering and they're saying, oh, is she going to do the thing? It's because they're helping you kind of create a more daring life. I think that's, that's, yes. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And I kind of imagine all our guides and in whatever form we connect with them. And I imagine them all, they're kind of all sitting around going, come on, you know, we've got all our lifetimes to wait for you. <laughs> yeah. to action, I know. You know? I know. And it was true though. Cause like uh, one thing that I would hear that I never really liked, but it was like, you know, don't bore God by asking the same things, like, you know, doing the same things every day, asking the same things. And I'd be like, you know what? God should just love me how I am. <laughs> like, I, don't yeah. I should be able I'm to do that. Right. I know. But, but I do think that there's a certain thing though. It's like, again, like to create your most daring life. And, mm. and I, and I feel like that's not something that everyone chooses to step into. And I think when you embrace the energy of the witch and you embrace the energy of the goddess, that's what she asks of you. She doesn't really ask mm-hmm. it of you. She demands it of you. Yeah. Yeah. And the gifts then when, when we connect with that and mm-hmm. step into what, what is most daring or what we fear most, then it's like we're rewarded with, for me, it was inspiration. It was poetry. It was words. It was that energy again to fuel and power the process. And it's a key part of the Shana Key is bringing humor into the story because when it's back to the kind of performance that it is, you want to hold people's attention and bring them with you on this journey of the story. So humor is a huge part of that the wit the humor the twinkle in the eye you know it's bringing all of that in to the writing to the the way the story is told you know even with the the pauses and the almost like the the cliffhangers you know and the twists along the way in in the tale so that's a vital part part of the ingredients <laughs> I like that. I like this part of the ingredients. No, it's, it's true though. There's a lot that goes into making a cake, but it's at the end, it's like, it's like, you know, you got the frosting, you've got the eggs, you've got everything, but then it's like that delicious first bite. It's that delicious telling of a story. Yeah. So I have, um, I think we're like, I know we're running out of time here. We might even be a little bit over, but I really wanted to tell, or I wanted you to tell um, the story that when you first kind of left corporate, because I know that you said that you heard the witches calling to you. So mm-hmm. I just like, I really want, especially as this is magical storytelling, I'd love if you could tell that story because I was so taken and mesmerized by it. And I would love if you could share that with people. Oh, yes. Thank you for asking. Yeah, um, so this is, it's all real, of course. Um, And it's a story in a few spirals. So the first spiral is the starting place when I consciously realized that the witches were whispering was, it was actually last August. So just last year in 2020, we went on a tour of the Edinburgh Dungeons. Now, I, I think you've been to Edinburgh. I have been to Edinburgh. I think you have been to Edinburgh. So for people, um, if you've been to Edinburgh, you can do these tours of the dungeons. There's a lot that went on underground in Edinburgh, in the old, in the old city. So this tour is all about um, educating you in the past, how things used to be. And it's made very realistic as well. So part of the tour was about taking part in a mock witch trial, mock witch trial, of course. <laughs> so <laughs> they're not going to do the real thing, are they? I was like, oh my god, so I'm already, it's already dead to me. I'm like, wow. So we went into the dark room, and um, there were just a few of us in the room. And they asked for a volunteer, and of course, I volunteer as I do. And the judge was up on the pulpit. It was all so very realistic and had his hammer and everything and was about to sentence me to witchcraft uh, to death 
for being a witch and was also trying to asking me to testify um, against another witch sister. And literally I was laughing, you know, with all of this, but something inside me flickered and I call it the flame of remembrance. It was like this flame that had been dormant for so long flickered back into life. And it was like it was in my womb or in my belly space. Mm. That it was just like, oh my goodness, this has happened. And I am almost sure this has happened to me. And in this life, I'm saying no. And it was like that flame fed up through me and out through my voice of like a no, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not testifying and you will not burn me as a witch for being a wise woman, a healer, an intuitive, all these things, a writer, a storyteller. And it was just it was so unexpected because I was just there with my family on this tour and just it was so unexpected and so real that I knew I had to listen. And so I was telling my kids, then we just moved on into the next room, into actually the torture chamber to learn about the different torture tools they used for people. So yeah, not not for the sensitive not, or, or not for the faint faint hearted. Hearted. But yeah, I yeah. Understand. Yeah. And I was saying to the kids, you know, this is real, this has happened, it really has. And when the tour ended, I just it really got my attention and I was Googling because I'd worked in Edinburgh and lived in Edinburgh for so long, but I had never connected in with the witches, never known much about it. So when I went up and Googled, I found there was a plaque by the castle, Edinburgh Castle, which is on a dormant volcano. And there was a plaque to commemorate the witches. It's called the Witches Well. And I love that the address is 555 the castle esplanade because I just relate the number five to a witchy to being a witchy number now <laughs> creativity and so I went up there to the well and um, just felt this sadness this yeah. grief which is sometimes what I can feel in relation to Ireland as well actually and this kind of anger like who were these witches and why hadn't I known about them before so I we were actually staying in Edinburgh for that week just by chance synchronistically so as I turned and was walking back to our accommodation just that's when the witches began to whisper even more loudly and these words as I was walking down in rhythm these words just came through me and it was witches rise up return to your power witches oh rise up now is the hour Witches rise up and step onto your throne. Witches rise up. It's time to come home. <laughs> oh my God. That's like a poem in and of itself. But oh my God. Yeah. yeah. That just blew my mind when you were saying that. Because yeah. I just feel like, like, it's like when we started the call, I was saying, I just kept getting power, power, you know, like, I just like, sorry, I'm like speechless for <laughs> I had a good cover. Oh my God. I'm gonna let you that, that was like, that was like the first part of the story. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, what is this? And um, at the time I was teaching a course on the Celtic medicine wheel and was it happened to be that week we were connecting in with the Kalyach witch, mm -hmm. which is the witch of the Irish land. And it said she, can, she created Ireland um, and the landscape of Ireland. So just all the synchronicities that came together, but at, you know, moving forward, it ended up becoming an online summit and the words healing the witch wound came to me. So I, it ended up being this great big event in December with so much energy. And for each speaker, these poems. So they were speaking to me through poetry and I can feel myself get like the heat, you know, it was through poetry and words and inspiration and power, like the surges of energy that that I felt and still do when I connect in with them. So, yeah, then what that was like a two spirals of the story, I guess. <clears throat> but then I came across a photo from my corporate days and it was me in the training room in the company I worked for. And in the background was the Edinburgh Castle. There was a gorgeous view of Edinburgh Castle. And I realized 
that it was the witches of Edinburgh Castle that were whispering to me all along to entice me out of corporate. Oh my into God. That's freelance. Cool. Because I guess at the time in 2017, if I had said I'm handing in my notice to follow my witchy path, I'm not sure I would have articulated that <laughs> back then. But um, yeah, here I am on, on the witchy path, you know, and the story continues. Like the story continues to unfold in magical ways. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm like, I'm always like on the verge of like tears, but like I just, because I feel like, I just feel so much power coming. I don't know if it's like just from you or if it's like the witches or if it's like Ireland, but there's just so much power. Like I feel like you're just like, um, you're like a repository of so much power. There's so many, I think, powerful beings, like lineages that are whispering through you. And like, that's mm. because you're their voice. And um, I think we're like, I think we're like over time, but whatever. Um, um, I, I, for some reason, while I've been doing this, um, while I've been doing this event, I've had like eight different people bring to me the story of the Little Mermaid. And it's weird because it's like funny because it's like, all over the place. And like, these people are not, they are, they are completely unrelated to each other. And I feel like that story keeps coming through. And it's of course of this woman losing her voice. Mm -hmm. And you know, I feel like, you know, when now I'm here talking to you, you are the reclamation of all of those voices. I feel like that's, you know, Ireland speaking through you, the witch is speaking through you. So instead of it's like the women who have lost the voice, it's like, this is the moment where we women rise up and claim the voice. Yes, yes, yes. And part of that, I really noticed that and felt that viscerally when I was doing the summit interviews and um, some, I did my session live and reading my poetry, I felt my voice and, you know, it's on YouTube now. People can go back and, and watch and maybe notice if you see the strain in my voice. And I did voice it at the time. I was like, I can feel my throat. I can feel like I'm being choked here and my voice will go all croaky. And I really noticed, wow, there's this big block here that the more I speak, and express myself the more this is clearing so yeah. voice played a huge part in that absolutely what you say about reclaiming our voice and again this is a spiral process I feel yeah. small steps with cosmic quantum amazing healing results <laughs> I love that okay I think that's <laughs> like I also we should this is like we should probably end the interview with that because that was just so incredible. <laughs> oh my God. So um, I, I know you have a free gift to share with our audience, but before I go to that, are there any last words of wisdom that you want to share? I think it's for, for people to really feel into where they feel any sadness or hurt or strain and to know that this can be healed when we feel into that part of ourself and that there's so many, there's so much support in this physical realm and, you know, as guides as well. So if people want to connect in with the Irish deities or anything I've shared, then yeah, um, connect with me with a free gift. And um, know that it is the time to rewrite our story and to share it. And if that feels scary, then even just write it out or in your form of expression, draw it, dance it. Because my grandfather used to say it's better out than in. And that was about his wind problem. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's so much wisdom in it. It's better out. We can't hold it in any longer. It's got to come out. The fire has to come out. Just have your glass of water with you as well. <laughs> I think Hagrid says that in the Harry Potter books. I was like, I think he says that too. Oh, really? <laughs> so it must be very ancient wisdom. Um, <laughs> but so you spoke briefly, you mentioned your free gift. I know that you actually are creating one that's just special for this audience. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's going to be a series of stories so people can sign up and you will receive emails of a series of stories. And I think what I'll do is 
to actually record them. So I'm going to record a whole series of stories over three days, I think feels like a magic number. And so you will be able to tap into the, the wisdom of what comes through and reconnect with your Shanaki storyteller, your witch, your goddess, your native voice. I am so I want to listen to this too. <laughs> it's like it's like me too. <laughs> audience, I want to listen to this. Like yes, no, but so um, when when you're seeing this, guys, the the link for that should be just below the video, so you should be able to get her free gift. And do you mind? Like I I would love like say these people, you know, they listen to the free gift, they love the stories, but they want to work more deeply with you. How mm. can they work more deeply? Yeah, I love your question. So I do one on one soul-based coaching to connect with your true voice and then I also offer programs throughout the year um, the one I'm currently offering is a wild Ireland pilgrimage but that will be in that will have started but if it if it calls to people to come walk with the pilgrims through the land of Ireland and it's all online which is even handier then um, you can get in touch email me and you'll be on my mailing list if you claim my gift. So I suspect another summit will be birthing over the next few months and then whatever other programs <laughs> come through. So really, it's um, I work very intuitively with what inspiration comes through that then becomes a program. <laughs> So. Yeah, looking at your programs, you, you have like, I know you have the Shanaki program. I know that you have like the witch program. And I, I feel like there's just so many beautiful, like, you know, divine downloads coming through you. So I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, anybody who wants to stay connected, you know, to, you know, to Emir, like, I just, you're going to have so much access to these like beautiful divine beings, to this divine storytelling and this divine wisdom. So I wholeheartedly recommend, you know, connecting more, more deeply with her. Thank you so, so much.